Hey there, coaches. I'm Rich Prado, owner of Play in School and host of Travel Ball Talk, where I talk to travel ball coaches from the best organizations about the current and future state of travel baseball. Today's call features David Hadler, owner of the McKinney Marshalls, based in the Dallas area. If words like values, goals, pillars of success, or standards interest you, then you're going to want to lock in to this conversation. I hope you enjoy this episode of Travel Ball Talk. Before we get into the show, I want to talk to you about what I predict to be the word of the year, value. For the last several years, travel ball organizations have marketed themselves to families with promises of exposure, events, cool uniforms, and placing players. Well, newsflash, every organization provides all of those things. Those things are now considered standard and are quite frankly a very low bar. Organizations run by smart staffs of forward thinkers are now looking to compete by adding value in so many more ways. Does your organization provide every player with recruiting videos? Does your organization provide every player with a scholarship fund that grows just by being part of the program? How about academic support through on-demand tutoring? fundraising opportunities, nutrition support. If these things intrigue you, email me at rich at playinschool.com so that we can talk. All right, welcome back to another episode of Travel Ball Talk. Uh, today we're heading out to Texas. I, I'm really excited. I got to meet um, today's guest a couple weeks ago, and we'll talk about that that event, I'm sure. But we've got David Hadler, the uh, owner of, and head honcho from the McKinney Marshals. That's a that's an organization I think I think is well known throughout the country, and and David is now the new state director with US Elite out in Texas. So we're we're going to talk about all of these things. Uh, but first, David, welcome to the show. How how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Well, um, before we hit record, we were we were talking about some non baseball stuff. Um, you know, you, you, you do have, or I guess you did have a, 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 a fulfilling, a long career outside of baseball in the, in the advertising world. And uh, I got to tell you, I find that fascinating. And I'm guessing there's a ton of, uh, a ton of parallels and a ton of lessons learned that, that, you can, that you can apply to this baseball thing, to this recruiting thing, to the showcase thing. Um, um, and I, I just got, I have a million questions about that, but have you, have you found that there's, there's maybe like one or two points that you seem to go back to often with players or families from lessons learned from, you know, way back when in the at, in the advertising world? Oh yeah, no question. You know, when I, uh, I would love to have made baseball a full-time career when I was young, but, you know, I had to pay bills. And so I started working in the advertising business, worked for, I was fortunate to work for some really uh, well-established and large agencies before I, I got into my own. But, uh, you know, honestly, everything I did kind of, kind of fueled and paid for my passion for baseball. Because like a lot of guys in baseball, I worked for years as a, just a volunteer unpaid coach. Before I was able to actually turn it into a business, I coached literally for years uh, as an unpaid coach. And in fact, as my wife uh, has reminded me many times, <laughs> I actually paid for a lot of kids to play baseball because I, I could never bring myself to say no to a kid ever. And we still don't who can't afford to play on a team for some reason. We, you know, we either scholarship them or find a way to get them paid. But I did that for decades. And so, my career in advertising uh, allowed me to do that. And when I started, of course, my own agency, and, and I actually answered only to myself, it also gave me the latitude and the time to spend with baseball as much as I wanted. So I you know, managed to hire a bunch of smart people, and, and they, uh, probably more than me, helped to run a very successful advertising agency. But it allowed me to uh, get deeper and deeper and deeper into my passion for, for baseball. All right, so I'll tell you what, let's talk about that baseball for a second. Um, I did a little bit of reading up, and it looks like the McKinney Marshalls got its start in 1996. You want, you want to take us back to, to 96 and, 
and how the uh, how the marshals got started and how you uh, came to to become involved. Well, the marshals actually were started by a gentleman uh, almost 24 years ago now named Mike Henneman. Uh, Mike, a lot of people will recognize Mike as a former major league all star pitcher with uh, Detroit and with the Rangers. And uh, Mike actually lived in McKinney, Texas. McKinney, for anyone who's not familiar with it, is just a suburban city on the outskirts of Dallas. So it's just right on the edge of Dallas. And uh, as is typical in a lot of of large metropolitan areas, you can't tell when you leave Dallas and enter Plano, then enter Allen, then enter McKinney, because it's just all one big metroplex. And so Mike, uh, and and he's told me this story many times, Mike wasn't thrilled with kind of a state of select baseball in the area. His sons were playing for other organizations. He wasn't really wild about how things were being done, about the quality of the coaching, about the things that were being emphasized. And so he decided to start his own group. Now, at the, at the time, I was actually uh, coaching a separate independent team, and it was a really good team. And whenever we came up against Marshall's teams, it was a battle. They were always so well coached and had such good athletes. And uh, when uh, I guess at some point in time, you know, I wound up talking with one of the folks with the Marshalls about bringing my team over to join the Marshalls. And I was flattered because it was such a great organization. And, you know, one thing led to another. And then about 16 years ago, uh, I found myself on the phone with uh, Mike one day, and basically uh, by the end of the conversation, I was actually running and owning the Marshalls. Uh, Mike had gone back to uh, start coaching again with uh, Detroit, and uh, you know that was something he he was of course passionate about. He had been in the in the, their their system for many many years, and he, he had the opportunity to go back and work as a pitching coach uh, at one of the minor league levels, and so I wound up taken over the marshals and uh, you know it's been great ever since and you know to your previous question a lot of the things that that i learned organizationally working uh, in advertising and in terms of communication skills you know i used and still use uh, in working with the marshals uh, so it's you know it's we, like i said we've been around almost 24 years now and for the last many many years uh Almost, I say virtually every kid, and almost every kid that's come through our program has gone on to play at the next level uh, in college. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we're really, really proud of. You know, we get really good kids coming into the program, and we try to help them focus on, on the right things. You know, our, our goals as an organization are built uh, almost completely around helping these kids be better not just better athletes, but better people. So it, it's it's great for us when we see these kids going and have the success that they have. You, you, you know, let's talk about that. And, and somebody who's been listening for a while and maybe listened to some of the last few episodes uh, may have noticed that, that I'm really getting a kick out of finding organizations that, you know, are, are very uh, transparent with what their goals and values are. Uh, because you know I've done a lot of these, and, I, and beyond just these these interviews, you know, I'm on a lot of travel baseball websites. I've probably been on every single website out there, so I, I've seen them. And not everybody is upfront with what their goals and values and and their mission is. And so it's kind of tickling me to see that some of these better organizations, some of the organizations I've had the pleasure of talking with their uh, head guys, their GMs and owners, are very clear about what their what their values are and you know once again i'm you know i'm on your website and i find something that says the marshall's way and it's uh you know it's a it's not a short list it's a pretty it's a pretty strong list of of things but can you describe what the the marshall's way is and and maybe hit some of the highlights of of what some of those bullet points are in there well, the Marshall's way kind of evolved. Uh, and I, when I first uh, took over the Marshall's about six, uh, again, I guess it's 16 years ago now, uh, maybe 17 coming up. When I first took over the Marshall's, um, I wanted to, and I don't know 
I'm not sure. Honestly, I, I didn't set out with a goal of I'm going to put this manifesto up there. But I decided that I wanted to, um, you know, have certain standards that the organization stood for. And I wanted them to be represented by the coaches, by me, by the players, uh, by, you know, everything that, that we did, frankly. So uh, I sat down and put together these uh, – the, the Marshall's way. And it's actually, uh, it's actually a, a, a long list of things and I won't go over all of them, but it's some real basic ones that, you know, I, I believe that everyone in, in baseball or really any sport should try to live up to uh, one is just respect for the game itself. That's the very first thing we list on the site. Um, and we tell our players all the time, that we want them to respect the game and we want them to respect anyone that participates in it. And this means opposing players, opposing coaches, uh, umpires, uh, fans of other teams. And sometimes that's hard to do. I mean, you've been to some of these games, but we tell them that if another organization or another player or another team or another coach uh, fails to act with class, then that's their choice, not ours. They're making the decision to, not act with class, not us. And we're not going to be taken out of our own game or our own approach because of the way uh, somebody else may act. So we insist that our players uh, respect uh, the game at all times. As an aside to that, you know, we played in a, I, one of my teams played uh, in a tournament up in, uh, at Oklahoma state uh, just a few years ago, three or four years ago. And, we played in the championship game. We, I think we wound up getting beaten in the championship game. And they were going to have a, a nice ceremony for the winning team uh, there. And so our guys, we packed up, and we were you know, out in the parking lot getting ready to leave. And the, uh, the um, plate umpire actually came out and caught me and said, hey, I just want to tell you that your team is the most polite team that I've seen on a field in years. And he said, I wish more teams acted that way. So that, that was honestly better than reaching the semifinals of that tournament, hearing that. Uh, and speaking of that, we, you know, one of our tenets also is about respect for umpires. We constantly tell players that, uh, you know, we're going to respect umpires, that it's their job to, to manage the game, to uphold the rules. They're not against us. You know, the rules are written to protect the integrity of game, the game, and the umpires are there to protect the integrity, integrity of the rules. We explained to them that, hey, you know, umpires do make mistakes. You know, they're humans. Uh, A lot of their calls are judgment calls. And if someone needs to go out and debate a call, it'll be one of the coaches. It won't be the players. So we tell the players that, you know, they say yes, sir. They say no, sir. We do not let them call the umpires blue uh, or, you know, hey, ump. They have to call them sir. And uh, if they're chasing down a foul ball to take the umpires, they don't toss it at them. They trot over and hand it to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, that that stuff becomes a little contagious among the players as well. You know, we also talk to the players about being respectful of themselves and how they care themselves because we remind them that they're representing not just themselves, but they're representing their parents and their high school coaches and their teammates and the organization itself. So we we talk about wearing our caps straight. We don't show up and dress in the dugouts. We don't get dressed or undressed in the dugouts. We show up, you know, ready to go. Um, we talk about having respect for our teammates. We talk about displaying good sportsmanship always. And uh, talk about being on time, 100% effort, playing with effort, you know, playing with class. Uh, we talk about fail with class and win with dignity. So, uh, you know, we don't want to be one of those teams that, you know, they act like jerks when they lose. Um, Unfortunately, we, we, you know, we see that. Uh, Everyone has seen that. Uh, We talk about having respect for parents. Uh, One of the the rules is about having respect for parents. One is about having respect for teachers. Uh, And basically just, you know, one for all and all for one. So we, we put those things out there. And when a new player joins our organization, we actually ask, him and his parents to read, uh, read that and make sure they understand it. I love it. I, I truly do. I love it. It's, um, it, it's, it sounds simple. 
and many of these things are kind of a throwback to a to a to days gone by. This is this is what some some of the kids might refer to as old school, um, but I love it. There's so many little things in there, and those little things add up, and those little things add up. Well, I up. can tell you, uh, I can tell you, that those resonate with the college coaches that we speak with. Uh, the colleges want guys. They want guys that behave that way because, you know, they're not interested in guys that that can't behave that way. You know, that that plays into our the four pillars of success that uh, we have for our players. Uh, we talk to them about, uh, you know, the days of just being a good athlete and getting recruited are are gone. You can't be just just be a good athlete and let that be and be so one dimensional that that that's the only thing that defines you. Uh, you know, you, you, of course you do have to have athleticism, but you have to have three other things as well. And this is what we tell our players. Uh, and I'm, I, I, I know we're not the only people, only coaches, organization telling players this, but we, we remind players of this uh, constantly is, you know, you have to have four things. You have to have athleticism, you have to have academics, you have to have a work ethic and you have to have character. And so by that, I, I, I'll briefly define what, how we define each of those. You know, obviously with athleticism, obviously you have to be a, a good athlete. Uh, but sometimes what separates great athletes from merely good athletes is just a work ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, the willingness to work on their body, the willingness to uh, hone subtle skills like bunting. I mean, a lot of people don't bunt anymore. I, I, to me, that's crazy. That's a great part of the game. Uh, a lot of them don't take the time to try to learn the strike zone. A lot of them have bad habits. Uh, you know, if, if you're in uh, in the cages hitting before a game or, or during a practice at your high school, that hitting exercise in the cages can be a great uh, way to help you learn the strike zone. Uh, it can it can help you uh, learn what you what you can control and what you can't control it's just the little details that the players are willing to work on to make themselves more athletic and then academics of course uh, you know as soon as we can in the players and uh, it typically it starts before their freshman year uh, we start talking and making sure that they understand that being a good student is crucial to playing at the next level mm -hmm. uh, and we also talk about um, the goal that each of them should have of becoming an academic player so that, uh, you know, academic player with a GPA, typically in most colleges of three, five or three, six or above, they, uh, uh, although I talked to a college yesterday, it was three, one, 3.1 GPA. Um, if you're an academic player, as you know, Rich, I mean, you get a lot larger uh, scholarship than you would if you're just an athletic player and for for this reason and i actually have heard and i think it was you that i heard say this and i agree with this completely i think parents should set aside a portion of all the money they use for lessons <laughs> every month and and use it for uh, act and sat prep training yeah uh because those grades can mean the difference in tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars of college expense yeah. uh, in terms of the, of the, you know, the money they get. Well, so they also have to have a work ethic. Uh, if they don't have a work ethic, it's going to be difficult to move to the next level because if, if they don't like practicing for an hour and a half or two hours at, uh, at high school, what's going to happen the first time they have a five and a half hour practice in college, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're not, not going to like it. Uh, and then finally, uh, they have to have character, uh, and we talk about this, and we we create lessons in the dugout and on the field about this because if you're a phenomenal player but you lack character, uh, the better college programs are going to pass you by. They're not interested in someone without character. You know, there will be schools out there that will sign you, of course, but uh, you're going to be surrounded by other people without character uh, if you go to those schools. And – you know, we, we tell our we tell our players all the time, and this is on my business card, that uh, that uh, ability and talent talks about what you can do, but character defines who you are as a person. Yeah. And so we talk to these guys all the time about doing that because as a as an organization, our goal as a player, we want 
players to understand what it's going to take to get to the next level, the type of work ethic, the things they need to work on, how we'll help them work on those things. Uh, and getting to the next level in our program may be um, as simple as just becoming the best high school player you can be, or it may be setting yourself up to play uh, at an even higher level, whether that's, you know, playing – getting drafted eventually or certainly playing at the college level. And so we really push that, but we also push uh, equally, uh, at least equally, if not more, just being a good person, being a good citizen, because we want them to get to the next level, not just as a player, but as a person as well. Uh, You know, we want them to be a good student, be a good teammate, be a good son, be a good uh, brother, uh, be a good teammate, because, uh, and I know you know these statistics, Rich. And I know most uh, travel program directors and coaches in the country, most high school coaches know these statistics, but not everyone's going to go on and play Major League Baseball. I mean, if you look at the statistics, uh, honestly, they're very sobering, which is another reason that I think parents should put money into, uh, you know, training for, you know, prepping for ACT or SATs. I saw some figures recently, and I'm paraphrasing here, so forgive me if I'm off a little, but I think I'm pretty close. Uh, Something like over 15 million youth baseball players in the country right now. There's over 15 million kids playing baseball at different levels in the country. Uh, Somewhere between four and 500,000 of those play in high school. So you can already see that there's a huge a huge drop down from youth baseball to high school, you know, between four and 500,000 playing high school ball. But out of that, maybe half a million or maybe even more playing high school ball, only about 35 or 36,000 will play in college. And of those only about 300 will wind up getting drafted. So we talk to the parents and the kids about these figures all the time. You know, baseball is a metaphor for life, but it can also, and the habits you develop with it can help you get ready for life because most of you, and and I say this to every group that I talk to every year, because I talk to every age group at our organization every year about this. And I'll say most of you, in fact, you know, maybe everyone in this room uh, can, will never be able to say that they got drafted. Uh, Some of you, many of you will be able to say you played in college but all of you will have a life after baseball because as the popular sayings go, at some point, everyone has to put down the ball. Mm-hmm. Some of them put it down early, some of them put it down later, but everyone puts it down sooner or later. And then what are you going to do after that? And unfortunately, I've seen, I've seen too many, over the years, I've seen too many guys um, that will go off and baseball is their only thing. It's them. It's the only thing that defines them as a person and they'll go off and, you know, maybe they'll even get drafted. Uh, but they'll spend two or three years in some minor league system. And the next thing you know, they're back giving lessons somewhere. And that's, then that's defining them the rest of their life. They just give lessons somewhere. And so we, we try to help these guys prepare for life. It, awesome. Awesome. Uh, you, I can't uh, tell you how much your – Marshall's way, which looks like it's about 14 bullet points, mirrors a document on my website. It's uh, the the document on my website is uh, is labeled "How to Win at Showcases." And if there's a coach or a parent or a player who wants to, it's a free PDF, and you can go over to playinschool.com/resources. Look for the "How to Win." at showcases and and the parallel that you're going to see between these two documents is is stunning and one thing that jumps out um, from both of these things it has almost almost nothing to do with the skill set of playing baseball your your marshall's way does not include throwing 95 miles an hour or running a 660 or hitting or hitting home runs it's it's uh, it's higher level things that that transfer beyond the baseball field, um, but what what they also encompass are attention to detail, and, and when you when you download the How to Win at Showcase uh, PDF, I mean you're you're going to see things that that almost bullet for bullet match up, and you nailed it when you said college coaches are looking for these things, 
right? Because the kid, yeah, the, yeah. the kid who disrespects his coach or his teammate or the umpire or his parent, that's not that's not a kid. Listen, we only, we only need a handful of players. Do we need a kid who's going to be that kid? No. Do we do we the kid who shows up to a to the ball field disheveled in uh, in, dressed in basketball, right? Basketball attire. When I say basketball attire, I mean, they're in, they're in gym shorts and in their, uh, in their shower shoes. We've all seen that kid. That kid's a good ball player. I got nothing wrong with that, but it takes the same amount of energy to go ahead and put those baseball pants on as it does to put on those, those basketball shorts. It takes the same amount of energy to put on, uh, to put on your turfs as it does to put on those those slides that the kids like to wear. And, and the thing yeah. is, is, presentation matters. And if you've done, you know, you're, you're a kid who's who's who maybe has some talent, people have been talking about him, and, and by the grace of God, a coach actually shows up to see this kid play. I try, I try to tell people they don't open their eyes at the first at-bat. They don't open their eyes on the first pitch. They have their eyes open the entire time. And so they see the kid from the second he gets out the car. And so you have this opportunity to make an impression. And when you get out of the car, you want to get out of the car looking like a ball player. And that, and though, and it's, and it's not, it's not terribly difficult, but those attention, the details, the, this, this, um, Marshall's way, I like how you called it a manifesto. It almost is a manifesto about 14 points, really interesting. And, and it really parallels, uh, this how to win at showcases uh, document that I put together. That's a, that's a free download. The other thing you touched on, and, and I want to direct people there to this, this SAT thing, this SAT thing is for real. And, and you probably heard me say something to the effect of, of, uh, you know, this, this, this baseball, this baseball game that we play, it really is a hobby. And, and parents need to approach it like that. And yes, we all spend money on hobbies, and, and so I'm not going to begrudge anybody for spending a bunch of money. But if you can, if you can invest in SAT prep, then do so. And and and, and, and I use these two words very intentionally. You're spending money on on baseball. You're investing on the SAT, ACT side. Those are very different. When you spend money, you don't expect it to come back. When you invest money, you expect it to come back in, 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 in with great returns. And um, again... You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, um, I, again, this, this resources page has become sort of a one-stop shop I'm putting together for moms and dads and coaches. And, and I, um, f- for a decade now, I've had my go-to person here in, in my hometown, Richmond, Virginia, uh, that I could refer. She's the best SAT coach I know. Uh, but I, I never had somebody that I could refer to in your town. And so I finally found somebody. There's an, there's a, it's an online test prep company, and the link is on that resources page. Um, so parents can go to that playinschool.com slash resources and find uh, find that, that it's called prep expert find that and if you don't like the online training find the best person in your town the sat ever listen if you can improve 50 points you might you literally might be saving 10 or 15 or twenty thousand dollars a year in college it's it's uh it's really it's really big and no amount of um hitting lessons is going to have that type of return on investment so anyway, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you. Um, uh, that is definitely music to my ears. I love, I, I love this Marshall's way. So if, if anybody wants to read the entire uh, manifestos as Dave calls it, just uh, find the McKinney Marshalls.com. That's Marshall's with one L and, uh, and find the Marshall's way document. Now you mentioned something kind of at the, at the top of the hour when we, uh, when we started talking about how you hired, uh, good people around you at your at your ad agency, and right. I'm, uh, I'm 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 guessing, you know the the parallels are strong there. And hiring good people in the baseball world is probably equally as important, if not more important. Um, can you can well, you t- I, I talk about a, find, finding those coaches? Yeah. 
I think it's critical, critically important. You know, I, I heard something. It had never occurred to me. Uh, and I heard something. I heard someone say this several years ago. Um, they were giving a talk somewhere and they said, uh, and they said that if you ask, uh, any successful man and many successful women, uh, to name the five or six most influential people in their lives, uh, that it's remarkable how often one of those people is a coach. So if you really think about that, and I thought about that for a long time and I heard that, it creates uh, almost an obligation to do things the right way because you're not just going out there and sitting on a bucket for two hours during a baseball game. These young, these young men are watching what you're doing. You know, the coaches are modeling behavior, whether they know it or not, whether they're aware of it or not, or whether they intend to or not. They're modeling behavior that these some of these young players are extremely impressionable they're all impressionable to a certain degree but we have to be careful what we do or say uh, because we are modeling behavior intentionally or not uh, to these players but uh, the thing that i i do is first of all i i want to hire absolutely the best people that i can find who coincidentally have a high level of baseball knowledge that they can teach uh, I'm not looking for uh, just pure baseball guys and I, who I have to apologize for their behavior or language all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we uh, – one of the things that we do with the marshals, and there are a few exceptions out there, uh, but for the most part we hire high school coaches and, uh, and uh, some college coaches to coach our teams. I – I prefer to have the high school coaches uh, and the college coaches, especially the high school coaches, because they tend to be more available than the college coaches. But the reason I like them is that they are trained educators. They're not just baseball coaches. They're trained, degreed educators who know how to deal with young people. They know how to talk to them. They know what to look for. They know they are trained to look for uh, things going on that the average person might not see because you know, these folks are, you know, these young players are maturing in front of our eyes. And uh, there are a lot of things going on in their lives, uh, not just crazy hormones raging through their body. They have a lot of, of uh, conflicts. They have a lot of points of tension. They have a lot of things going on that can cause them to either temporarily or or more long term go off the rails every now and then. And I like the fact that our coaches are trained educators who are trained to look for those kind of things. And we talk about going and, you know, pulling these young men aside. It happens pretty frequently. They'll pull one of them aside and say, Hey, you don't seem like yourself. What's going on. It seems to me there's something going on with you. What's going on. Can we talk about it? And, you know, it's, it's surprising sometimes what some of these kids will say to you and you can tell that something is really impacting them. So, you know, I, my guess is it's simply hiring the best, human beings that we can find uh, who will model the right kind of behavior. Uh, they don't have to be choir boys, but I want them to uh, model responsible adult behavior in front of these guys so these guys can, you know, we can help them learn how to act in times of, of uh, stress and in times when things are going great. And, you know, baseball games, it can be an intensely stressful. There can be things that make it seem like the end of the world to some of these guys and some organizations to some of the coaches. So we try to use the games and the coaching uh, and our behavior to create life lessons for these guys. Uh, you know, while you're, while you're talking about that and you're talking about these, some of these stresses, are there, are there examples that you can think of where, where you pull a kid aside and you say, Hey, what's going on? You, you know, some, something, something off today with you. Are there, yeah, I, any, I, I any have that stories happen. that's that that stick out from your years doing this with kids yeah. and without you know obviously without embarrassing or or specifically discussing any uh, any any certain kids. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I had a player that uh, that he was playing fine on the field, but off the field in the dugout, uh, just standing around, it was clear that there was something off. And uh, so I pulled him aside after a game 
uh, and he wasn't playing for my team specifically, but he's playing for one of our teams. And I pulled him aside and I said, and I started talking to him about school and things. And, and he was reserved and polite. Yes, sir. No, sir. And I said, you know, I've, I've, I've known you for a couple of years now and I've been around you. And I said, it, it, you don't seem like yourself. Are you feeling okay? Is everything okay? And uh, he just simply turned to me and he said, my parents are getting a divorce and they're fighting nonstop and they're using me as a weapon to, for each other. He said, he oh. said, I, I just feel like I'm being batted back and forth between the two. And, you know, when somebody just suddenly says something like that to, to you, you have to think for a second, what can you possibly say? Yeah. You, you know, you, you can't be tried enough to say, oh, I'm sure things will work out because they might not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I just talked to him about how the fact that, of course, we were there to help him any way we could. Uh, I asked him if he had talked to anyone at his school about it and the counselors, and he said no. And I suggested that he go talk to the counselors at high school because I said not only are they trying to – deal with this but but they deal with it you know unfortunately pretty frequently and i think they can give you some good advice and i got him to promise that he would do that and i said if if you don't hear the answers that you want to hear or something that you think helps you come back and talk to me and i'll i'll help you find something and uh you know just you you see things like that and you know we had a parent come to us uh um uh, one time and just said that they had found some social media where their son was being bullied, uh, which was surprising because this is a big, strong kid. And just a few years ago, and uh, the, the kid was talking about maybe threatening suicide, uh, oh. which was shock, shocking and terrifying to hear. Yeah. And so we immediately put together an approach to, uh, to try to become a little more engaged with this young man and get him a little more involved and feeling a little bit better about himself. And so we, we did it subtly so that it didn't, uh, you know, subtly he wasn't just covered with a flurry of activity from coaches, but several of the coaches found ways to engage with him at different levels and at different times to start uh, getting him feeling a little bit better about himself. Well, and the parents of course were highly engaged. They got him into the right kind of counseling and now, a few years later, he is flourishing and doing extremely well. But that was, honestly, that was the one time that was really frightening. It, oh, man. You, you, you know how often, uh, I think we've, we've said it in this conversation, how, 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 how baseball teaches about life. But it, we sometimes got to step back and, and remember that, that life is actually happening to these kids. So you may, you may see things that... Uh, that might mean a divorce. It might mean an illness. It might mean bullying. It might mean any number of, you know, girl problems or whatever. Um, and, and so, yeah, some, some, sometimes, uh, yeah, some, sometimes you, you gotta, you gotta say, Hey, maybe it's, uh, maybe those extra reps aren't what he needs right now. Maybe he needs to hang in the dugout and, and just have fun and cut up and and or or talk with coach or talk with his buddies and and um, you know, man that's um, those are those are you know Rich when I was uh, when I was when I was a young coach and first coaching uh, I I and I reckon I recognized it after a while and I'm almost embarrassed by it now well I am embarrassed by it now but I would get way too caught up in games I was yeah. way too hung up on winning and losing. Uh, I was the first one to argue with an umpire over any perceived slight. And uh, over time, you know, I matured and figured out that that wasn't helping anything. But one of the things that uh, I learned along the way was that it's rare that you see a player behaving the way some coaches and some parents act. It's rare because the players are enjoying, enjoying the moment. They're enjoying the, the pure joy of playing the game. Now, don't get me wrong. They're competitive. Mm -hmm. as all good out. But they're, they have just a joy in playing the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes coaches and parents get way too hung up on uh, individual success or winning games. Uh, you know, they're living and dying with every at-bat. When the players view it for what it is, it's, 
you're not competing against another team as much as you are competing against the vagaries and inc- wonderful inconsistencies of the game. You know, it's just uh, think about it. It's the only it's the only sport that I know of, and I might be wrong about this, but it's the only sport I know of where there isn't a defined uh, set of parameters for a field. I mean, no one tells you how far the the, yeah. the line down left field is. It can be anything. <laughs> uh, so it's just the inconsistencies of the game. The the players love playing the game, but the you know sometimes the parents and the and even the coaches get a little carried away. And I, I think that's to the detriment of teaching the players the game and even the players' enjoyment of the games. Uh, you know, I gave a talk uh, several years ago to an organization here in the Dallas Fort Worth. Metroplex, and they asked me to talk about just the, you know, kind of the state of youth, youth baseball in uh, the Metroplex. And I agreed to do it before I, after I agreed to do it, I realized, well, I don't know enough to talk that subject to talk about it. So I went out and did some research, and uh, I found, I wish I could remember the exact source of this research, but there was some research that had been done by a national organization over a period of a few years, and they had done research with uh, a half million youth athletes and they defined youth as anyone 18 and below uh, still in school and a part it was a very extensive research and it was about every aspect of playing sports and uh, the thing that got to me it just killed me to read this uh, was it said uh, one of the questions that they asked these youth players was uh, what is the thing you like least about being involved in youth sports? The number one answer was the ride home after games. Oh. Uh, it just crushed my heart to read that. So, uh, you know, I, I built my talk with this group uh, about that aspect of it. And I still every now and then have people come up to me and say, hey, I, I actually – was there the day you talked about this and I've thought about it ever since. So, uh, you know, like we've been talking about this morning, it's, it's more than, it's really more than just a game. It is a game, but it's also training these young men to deal with life, which and, uh, I'm not sure which of those I enjoy the most. <laughs> um, well, let's, let's transition a little bit. That's the, these, the last two sort of, uh, topics have been a little little heavy you and i have uh communicated a little bit over the last several years but we finally met in person uh two weekends ago at the two weekends ago at the winter banquet that mark helsel held for his u.s elite organization and uh we sat one table apart and, and we got to visit with each other and uh say hello and that was the first time we met in person, and um, and I gotta tell you, uh, if Helsel's listening, that was an unbelievable event. Unbelievable. I mean, well, you know, it's a, it's an unbelievable organization, uh, and you know, over the years, I've been approached many, many times about affiliating with other organizations. Uh, I've been approached to sell my organization. I've been approached to buy other organizations. Um, but the first guy and only guy really that I listened to seriously was Mark Helsel when he talked about affiliating with him. Um, the things that he stands for personally, uh, are of the highest order, highest levels of integrity. And he insists on his U S elite baseball program, um, operating at the same level. Um, and with the marshals, for the most part, we've been, uh, a high school level organization, for you know many 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 years uh and i've kind of avoided staying out of youth baseball as much as i can for you know say 13 and below but uh one of the things that i really like about what mark is doing is one of the things that uh you know as the state director for us baseball now in texas one of the things that i'm going to be helping him do is uh bring uh the u.s elite program to texas uh beginning with youth baseball and then letting it grow up you know through the ages as the players mature 
uh, Mark has done a an absolutely wondrous job of putting together uh, an approach to coaching and playing the game that, uh, and I, there are some fine organizations out there, but I haven't seen anyone who has touched on so many meaningful things that matter to young men and their parents and their families and to college coaches as Mark has done. Uh, he is uh, fanatically driven to detail, uh, which is a great thing uh, for somebody trying to put together an organization like that. He has had a high level of success first up in Pennsylvania where he founded U.S. Elite and then all the way, uh, you know, he's now got teams all up and down the East Coast, and he's starting to get into scattered states around the country, uh, met some wonderful coaches from, uh, you know, California and Washington State and Arizona who are starting to uh, spread the word about this fantastic U.S. elite program. And uh, and it's it's not just baseball. He has some wonderful things that they teach these players about life and life skills. And uh, as an example, for instance, he's rolling out uh, youth camps and we'll be rolling them out in all the states in which, in which uh, U.S. elite is present. Well, and, listen, uh, listen yeah, to, listening it, to you, it, not, not to interrupt here, but listening to you talk earlier, you used a phrase – about the marshals and um before we started talking about the marshal values you talked about how you guys have certain standards and and right. knowing mark and being around uh u.s elite and getting to work with u.s elite um th- that phrase uh kind of kind of made the light bulb go off in my head because that almost parallels exactly with the phrase that that Mark uses on a daily basis, which is uncommon standards, um, uncommon standards, un- yeah. uncommon standards. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, then you start looking at your manifesto of these, uh, these, um, these Marshall's values, um, yeah. you, you know, it's or the Marshall's way. I'm sitting there going that it almost feels like y- y'all wrote these together, but you didn't. <laughs> well, no, we didn't. And, you know, it's funny. When we started, when we first talked, it was about a year ago, uh, Mark had gone on to the website. Uh, we had exchanged a few emails before we actually talked in person. And uh, Mark, had gone, Mark had gone on to my website and looked at that. I had gone on to his website and looked at his program. And we immediately felt like kindred spirits because we immediately recognized that we felt absolutely the same way about so many things. And, you know, it's, it's, we've talked about this since, but last summer, uh, Mark came down to Texas and we had never met in person, by the way, we had just talked on the phone many times and, uh, Mark came down to Texas to bring one of the, uh, really fantastic U S elite, uh, 16 U teams down to play in a big, uh, a big tournament down in Houston at the end of the summer. And it's a big event, nice big showcase event. And, uh, so Mark asked me if I could bring some of the players from Texas down to play with the, the U.S. Elite players in Houston, and we'd just meld these two, two groups together and play as teams. So we took, I think, five or six players down there, and uh, Mark asked me if I would come down and help him coach this team for this tournament. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, we, uh, we literally got out of our cars in the parking lot at the same time before the first game and just fell literally into lockstep, literally. And uh, it was like we had been working together forever and had known each other forever because we're so similar in our view of how we should be approaching these things. And like I was starting to say a while ago, some of the things that he's putting together specifically for U.S. Elite, uh, I think they're going to really revolutionize the way people think about youth sports. Now that sounds, I understand how that sounds. That sounds really grandiose and it sounds like, Oh yeah, here we go again. Another mm-hmm. one of these groups. But, but, um, I mean, you've been around Mark. He has some really interesting, innovative, uh, ideas about how to stress values to these players and how to stress the right kind of principles and the right kind of approach to baseball, to life, to school, 
And uh, it's really the reason that, you know, I chose to get involved with him because I could have kept just running the marshals forever. They had been doing, you know, well for a long time. But I almost felt compelled uh, to get involved with the U.S. Elite when I saw how their standards and their approach to uh, to coaching mirrored what we wanted to do. And the, the, to me, the benefit for the Marshals is that there's a bigger stage because they're across the country. They have some true national teams that some of our players, you know, uh, took advantage of last summer and played in Arizona and in Texas and a couple of other places. Uh, I, I just, I'm a real fan of uh, Mark Helsel, real fan of U.S. Elite, and I'm really excited about what the future holds for us working together here in the state of Texas because uh, what he wants to do and the kind of standards that he wants to try to uphold uh, is real music to our ears and music to our ears and his his national platform is going to help us do it bigger and better faster here in Texas. Well, one of the things that I continue to shout from the top of my lungs is that teams that are competing on price point are in a race to the bottom and they don't even recognize yeah. that yet. And yeah. um, I have, first of all, I, I have no idea what, what, most of these organizations are, are charging. I have no idea what, what U.S. Elite is charging. But what I do know is that they don't compete on that parameter. What they're competing on no. is value add. And, and the re reality is, is all these organizations across the country, good, bad, ugly, whatever, they all wear cool jerseys. They all play in pretty interchangeable events. You know, they all get the hat and they all get, you know, most of them train at, in some variety and most of them are placing guys. And to me, those few bullet points are really the bare minimum, right? Like everybody's yeah. doing that. But yeah. when you start talking about what is being provided for the players, um, I mean, I, listen, I was just one of many, um, you know, outside organization, that is basically being provided as sort of their baseline. There's there's the recruiting video aspect. You know, I know just off the top of my head, they're they're incorporating um, uh, blast motion for all their players, crossover symmetry for players, uh, a couple different training apps, vision training. I mean, I mean, it's like the list goes on and on and on. I can't I can't even right. You know team team trainers team doctors it's it goes on and on and on and on and i'm sitting there going that's value add right like a cool jersey is not value add that's baseline right. everybody has that Price of entry. yeah um and the the folks who are who are looking at providing more value the parents are going to recognize that i think and and i honestly don't think that parents are as price sensitive. Yes, some are. I get that. I get it. Um, you may have to scholarship some kids. I, I understand that. But I think that parents don't want the cheapest. I think they want the best. Um, they want value. They, yeah, want, they want value. They want, what they want is what's best for their kid. And, you know, you know, I was going to make a point. If I could interject something, I, yeah. I was going to make a point while ago in terms of the innovative things that Mark's doing. And, you, you know, he, he has some ideas that you, you know, I like to think of myself as being innovative mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I worked in advertising for so long, but Mark is coming up with some truly innovative things. So like, for instance, one of the things he unveiled to us is we're going to start doing this across the entire U.S. elite spectrum, across all the states uh, and all the organizations is uh, free youth camps uh, mm -hmm. to teach them baseball skills. Wow. And these will be any kid can come. They don't have to just be U.S. elite players. Any kid from any organization can come. They're absolute, you know, they're just free camps where you can come and there'll be like nine or 10 stations, but one or two of those stations won't be on baseball. One or two of those stations will be on life skills. There might yeah. be one on communication or just on, you know, on, uh, I know Mark gave one and one of his stations was 
teaching the kids about how to shake hands and look people in the mm-hmm. eye and actually talk to them and listen to them. Who does that at a baseball camp? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. No doubt. Listen, we I, I, I didn't I didn't necessarily mean to turn this into a commercial for uh, Mark Helsel and U.S. Elite, but but I've got the utmost respect for what he's doing, and I have the feeling that in a few years, uh, s- some uh, some of the big programs are gonna gonna turn around and and kind of be surprised that maybe U.S. Elite snuck up on them, and and so I, I would say don't I would say don't be surprised. Um, because he's he's growing in innovative ways, like you just said. Um, you know, if, if you hear this stuff, and if you if you know David and you know the Marshals, I, I think that speaks to uh, the credibility. If he's willing to kind of hang his hat on U.S. Elite, call call Mark up, ask him about the uh, what what the deal is uh, with the state director position. If if there's not a state director in your state, and tell tell him I sent you. Uh, if you're listening to this, because uh, that that is a it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty unique thing he's got going on uh, to to grow that brand across the country. Um, but listen, I know we're we're running a little short on time, so I wanted to ask you a, a couple last questions. I know I know that we could probably talk for another hour on this, but but let's let's kind of transition, kind of zoom out a little bit from Marshalls and and from U.S. Elite and talk about kind of the state of travel baseball uh, with the last few minutes I, that I have you here. And, and um, you know, the way I always put it with people is the good, the bad, and the ugly. What, a, what, a, what, are, you, what are you seeing out there, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, you know, thing, things you're loving right now and, and maybe opportunities for improvement, things that, things that you think could be tweaked. Um, yeah, yeah, just what do you, what do you see? So I'm going to take those in reverse order because I'd like to okay. I'd like to end on something po- I'd like to end on something positive. But uh, if I think about the bad and the ugly, uh, there are some bad and ugly organizations out there. I mean, everyone has seen them. Um, I, I mean, I've I've seen organizations. Uh, most of us have. I saw an organization last summer where coaches were very very loudly dropping f bombs at umpires oh. uh, in the, uh, at you know, in the field of play, which is it's unbelievable when you hear that kind of thing. I've uh, I've seen coaches go out and jerk players off the mound, literally physically grab them by the arm and jerk them off the mound, which mm-hmm. they're inviting a lawsuit. They're inviting lawsuits literally and figuratively. Uh, but I, what I see mainly is I see a couple of things that I don't like about uh, about uh, youth travel ball, youth baseball. One of the things I see is that uh, I'm not against anyone making money running a business at all, but um, I, I see organizations that are promising the moon in exchange for someone writing a check, and I, I just don't I don't think they should be doing that. I think there has to be uh, someone to help set expectations. You know, we have lost players from our organization in the past because parents weren't ready to hear uh, yeah. reality of the situation. I, I had a parent of a player that had signed up with us uh, uh, called me one day and asked me if I knew uh, coaches at a uh, you would know the university, a major university okay. program here. A in big one. Okay. And a, a big one. And, they, and I said, well, yes, I, I know the coaches there. And they said, well, we'd like you to call and set up a workout for our son because he wants to go to school there. And their son was a, it was the fall of his junior year. And I said, well, he's a, you know, he's, he's going to be a PO, but he's not ready to be in front of them yet. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, he, you know, he's, he's, he's still 16. He's a young junior. He's throwing in the low Mm seventies and he is, he is, uh, 17 to 20 miles an hour away from them paying serious attention to him. So let's wait and let him get stronger. And I talked to them about, you know, some of the, the broad parameters that the college is looking for at division one, two, and three, in terms of uh, arm velo and, and, you know, exit speed and things like that. I may have gotten too detailed for him, but he said, well, I've never heard anyone explain it that way, but thank you. And I said, okay. And I thought we were done. 
but then I got an email about four days later and said, uh, we've gone and tried out and talked to another organization. We're switching organizations because they believe in him and they will get him <laughs> meetings with coaches. Oh. And, and so, you know, we just try to be realistic and we, you know, we try to, not everyone does that. Uh, we do hold our coaches to standards. I, I, I don't like bullies as coaches. Uh, and I've seen some coaches out there that are bullies. Uh, I, I think that, uh, there are many aspects of youth baseball where uh, more professionalism is needed and not less professionalism. And that doesn't mean you have to be a professional coach, but it does mean that you have to act with, uh, have some sort of standards in terms of just common decency and the language that you use to players. There's never an excuse for a, a youth baseball coach to use profanity to youth players. Never. Uh, but I've, I've seen that happen. Uh, and, you know, some of the organizations are out there just to make uh, just to make money. I don't, I don't like I said earlier. I don't mind if they make money. That's fine because they've got to stay in business. It's the American way of life. You have a business and you want to make a profit. But if you're only doing it for money and you don't really care about the baseball product or what you're teaching the players or even if you're teaching the players, then I, I don't think that's that's something that uh, you know anyone honestly should be doing. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we see that, um, uh, we, well, we've all seen it. Let's be honest. We've all seen that. So I think setting expectations for the players and parents early is a better, is a job that a lot of organizations could do better. I'm sure we could do it better at times too, but we certainly try to do it as much as we can. I also do not like a focus on winning, uh, at all costs, mm -hmm. Uh, and I see that in some organizations, um, uh, and there's some that try to skirt the rules and get around, uh, age limits to try to do it. It's, it's crazy. You know, I'm not sure what we're teaching these kids when we do this and just, uh, I, and I don't know how you would do this, but I would love to see a little bit more education, uh, for uh, parents, especially about what to expect and what they should actually be striving for, uh, in youth ball. And if, if you got, I'll just tell a very, very quick story. I had a, uh, a mom approach me a few years ago saying that she thought her son, um, you know, was starting to show uh, signs of being an exceptional baseball player and that they were looking for a, uh, that he was keenly interested in it. He wanted to do everything he could to develop himself. So they were looking for a good development organization. And I said, you know, we try to do that. So she talked about what we did and standards and practices and things for a while. And so anytime someone is moving to us from another organization, I always ask the question, why are you leaving your other organization? And she said they weren't playing enough games at the other organization. And so I said, well, how many games were we looking to play? She said, well, we're looking for an organization where we will play a minimum of 130 to 140 games. Whew. Uh, and so I knew immediately that we were not talking about high school, play, a high school player, because, you know, high school players just playing a couple of months in the summer. You know, if, if you had a good summer, you played 55 or 60 games. Most people would play 48 to 55 games. And, uh, and so I said, well, how old is your son? And she said he was eight. And, uh, so and, you know, I, I saw an example several years ago where uh, um, I was at a youth tournament and I started watching one game and I heard some parents talking about the number of pitches this one kid had thrown and this kid had gone out for the seventh inning of a game uh, and he had already thrown over 135 pitches and he was 13 years old. He was 13. And I don't know what I, as I, I don't remember what the tournament was now, but I don't know if there were standards in place at the time, if, if they were trying to watch pitch counts at all. But the thing that struck me was that the coach that was sending him back out there was his father. His father was coaching the, the team. And so, you know, some of those things I don't like now to the good, uh, I see organizations, there are organizations here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and down in Houston that absolutely are doing a lot of great things. 
uh, they are starting to focus, as you saw with Mark Helsold and U.S. Elite in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago when we met up there. There are organizations that are starting to do things to help players understand how their bodies are working. They're, they're working more on mechanics. They're working more on metrics. They're working on measurement, and they're working on teaching players how to optimize the efficiency and the uh, overall uh, uh, results of what they're doing. Uh, there are organizations that focus on academics like we do. There are organizations that focus on character like we do. And there are organizations that try to help players maximize their ability to get recruited like we do. So the folks that are taking seriously the development part of it, uh, and there are a lot of them out there that do it really, really well. I admire all of those uh, organizations. But uh, those are the ones that I think people should go to. And, and I tell people all the time, if you don't play for us, make sure you play for an organization that stresses these things, you know, these specific things. Because there are organizations out there doing a wonderful job. Some are not, but people should just stay away. Did I lose you, David? No, I can hear you now. Okay, can you hear gotcha. Me? Yeah, yeah, you, you, the, the last couple words. Um got scrambled for some reason man i you're you're dead on man i i've i've enjoyed this so much i think we could probably go a whole nother hour i've got about 17 more bullet points i wanted to get to but uh in in respect of your time and in respect of uh this lunch date i have at the best barbecue town uh best barbecue place in uh in town uh we're gonna have to probably cut it here um this is this has been fun we're going to do this uh probably several more times hopefully on air um david hadler we're going to be able to find these uh this interview and all the links to the marshals to u.s elite texas and all of your other twitter accounts uh will be over at playingschool.com slash hadler that's h-a-d-e-l-e-r are i probably should say that at the beginning of these uh of these conversations but um that's okay i'll I'll blast it out on twitter here when this goes uh this goes live man i I really appreciate you coming on yeah and you know rich thank you for having me and keep stressing the right things that you're stressing you know uh video for these players is important and uh, uh prep training for act and sat couldn't be more important so keep pushing the right things like you're doing Thank you for having me on. You got it. You got it. I'll uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. See ya. I'm having so much fun bringing these shows to you each week. If you'd like to recommend a coach for the show, please don't hesitate to shoot me a note at rich at playinschool dot com or DM me on Twitter at playinschool. Again, my name is Rich Prado. I'm the founder of Play in School. My goal is to continue to create products and services that add value to you, the travel ball coaches, your players, and their parents. Visit playinschool.com to see some of the ways we're doing that. Or better yet, let's set up a call. Until next time, thank you for listening to Travel Ball Talk.